today we have not one but two guests for you. Um, one has 10 years developing consumer and B2B products at scale across the UK and the US, who most recently supported Meta's health and fitness team with a focus on improving consumer health through tech like AR and VR. She holds a bachelor's degree in social policy with government from the London School of Economics and is a Fulbright scholar. The other is a medical doctor who specializes in women's health and has also an, an additional degree in global public health, which saw her publish research on prenatal testing in resource poor settings and research on perinatal bereavement. Um, she also owned a successful women's wellness clinic in London. So today I have the huge honor of introducing Fifi Kara and Layla Kara Newton. Welcome. Hi, Hello. Hi Emma. Emma. <laughs> Great to be here. Yes, it is so good to have you. And so uh, how did you two meet? I mean, were you friends before this or like you just kind of found each other somehow and and it was game on? Exactly that. We, we met, you know, a couple of years ago, you know, um, re realized that we had some things in common, similarities, and that was that. So, yeah. Are you joking? Yeah. I'm joking, obviously. You know we're sisters, Emma. No. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. to everyone listening, I mean, we were literally just talking before we started recording this interview about, I was saying, I know nothing about you ladies. Oh, I mean, so I've done my research. But literally, I knew nothing. So, no, I did not know you <laughs> sisters. Okay, that explains everything so she, hey, she i feel like older, yeah she's my older sister and yeah <laughs> wow so you just kind of both ended up by um was it complete fluke or chance that you both ended up somehow in the wellness space yes <laughs> to some extent i think like our our mom is a nurse and she's been a nurse pretty much our entire lives, yeah. I think over nearly 30 years now. And she kind of focuses on um, at-home care. So she's like in the community, she's really engaged with her patients. She knows them over <laughs> years and years, right? And I think maybe that inspired Layla to become an OB-GYN um, and she can speak about that. But uh, I came into the health um, space maybe in the last couple of years. And that's when our two worlds sort of uh, converged. And we yeah. said, maybe we could do something here. But health has been in our family and in our lives from from when we was born you know? yeah you know it's interesting because both of my parents were nurses and um, my dad was actually a hospital administrator but I have had nothing to do with the health industry at all in yeah. during the span of my career so I mean clearly that's something that really resonates for you though which I love as a result of you know watching your um, mum in particular um, be a part of that space and I, that's interesting the whole at home piece yes. too because that's clearly yeah. an influence <laughs> on what you guys have designed too I think um, you're right yeah <laughs> yeah also um I mean really often when I mean I have a design background too and so often we talk about how great design is really born out of a need to solve for something yeah. right and in this instance uh it was your own story Layla combined yeah your experience as an OBGYN that really compelled you to create a better system for monitoring maternal health. Mm -hmm. So tell us about Aster. What is it and why is it so absolutely necessary? Yeah, we can probably start with your story because it really is the origin of Aster. Yeah, so just going back for over four years now, as you mentioned, Emma, I was a what we call junior doctor at the time, um, working in the ER, for example. Um, I'd been around medics pretty much my whole life, as we've said, and I became pregnant with my first son. Um, I was considered low risk. I was healthy. I was pretty young, you know, um, and I didn't need or it didn't seem like I needed too much additional testing. But going through that pregnancy, I noticed a few things were missing. Things were being sort of slip slipping through the cracks and my concerns around maybe how I had measured my own bump at home um, and it seemed pretty small were being dismissed and, and brushed off. But I, as a medic, put my trust in the, the professionals that were looking after me essentially. Mm -hmm. um, but it all came to a head when 
I had a urine sample. As we know, it's pretty common to have a urine sample every time you go and see the doctor or the midwife. Um, and it just wasn't taken or tested around 34 weeks of my pregnancy. Um, so actually I didn't have a urine sample for around four weeks towards the end of the pregnancy. When I did go back into what we call um, triage or labor and delivery towards the end, um, we realized that there had been a sample sent about eight days prior and nobody had checked. And it was that sample that showed I had undiagnosed preeclampsia for that period of time. Mm -hmm. And potentially, as we look back, I had had preeclampsia probably from around 31 weeks of pregnancy and I was now 38 weeks. So to cut a longer story short, if I can, <laughs> um, I ended up with a whole cascade of events from that diagnosis of preeclampsia, which was an induction at being admitted to the ward. Um, the induction unfortunately failed and I had what we call a hyperstimulation reaction, which again wasn't taken seriously, unfortunately. In the end, we had to be rushed for a crash cesarean section because my son's heart rate was what we call bradycardic. So it was about half of what was normal. Um, and that ended up in him being delivered completely flat. So not breathing, not crying nothing like that mm -hmm. um he had resuscitation and you can imagine as a doctor i i know exactly what was, was going on at that time um he's well now thank god he had to spend time in the nicu he had a whole host of tests and he was even born at four pounds 13 completely at term so he was absolutely tiny and again that was something that was missed throughout so the whole experience the recovery from that the mental health implications of that, the family effect of that was why when me and Fifi started talking after a period of years and years going through the investigation process and so on, um, and because our worlds then collided in our professional backgrounds, we thought, you know what, we can do better in this space. Mm -hmm. There shouldn't be this fear around just having a baby, giving birth, being pregnant. Um, how can we improve this space for people like ourselves? And that's kind of the origin of why Asta was born. Yeah. And we can we can talk a little bit about um, how we came to the idea. Like that is the origin of the company. But um, it was around about the beginning of this year. So 2023, that um, the result of kind of the investigation mm -hmm came came to us and we saw in a long list everything that went wrong we thought wow this is this is things that are like solvable right like not everything is solved yeah can I dive in for a minute because I'm curious so you, it was so is that standard practice that there was some sort of investigation no post that okay so that's something you initiated because you oh, went yes. this should never have happened we need to get to the bottom of it okay yeah. Oh, and on that point, um, I will say it was actually Fifi that told me and almost, I would say, pushed me to investigate. I would never, never in a million years have thought as a doctor within that health system, which is the NHS, for example, would be on the side of the, the complaint as such. Right. Mm -hmm. But it was that whole experience and Fifi pushing me to say, you know what, we need to look into this. We need to make sure it doesn't happen to anybody else. And I would look around the ward and think, well, you're right, because actually it could happen to every single person here if if it could happen to a doctor. So yeah, it was a, it was a whole investigation. It took four years. And in the end, I had mm -hmm. the whole list of what happened. And I did have an apology from the trust. Um, and, you know, the investigation resulted in additional training and things like that. So we do hope that that lessons were learned. But it was definitely a position I never expected to be in or ever wanted to be in, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but I do hope that some good has come out of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Four years. That's incredible. And so, Fifi, that was your mission. You were just like... Okay, I'm on a I'm on a quest now. I yeah, I am a bit like that. I think <laughs> I remember sort of saying, well, I think the I had some lawyers at the time for like corporate lawyers, but they had a medical negligence department. And I thought, and I emailed them and I said, is this something that you could just take a look? Just hear hear her out, see if there's anything there. And they did, and it ended up them going, Yeah, there's there's quite a lot here. Yeah. And we should definitely look at this. Um, so yeah, that that was the origin of Asta. And when we first started talking about this problem, we actually were thinking about maybe developing um a physical clinic, like actually building a maternal health clinic from the ground up, right? And there's a few folks who who are looking at that right now, and I actually think it's a great model. But we then started to realize that how um scalable would it be for us to make you know make that change and build this clinic could we affect 
um, hundreds of thousands, millions of, of families and, and mothers. So then we started to look at the underlying infrastructure in the US. So you've got midwives and ob and nurse practitioners and doulas. And can we help them deliver better care? Can we help them not have this happen again for someone else? And is that through software? Is it through technology? Is it through hardware and um, remote patient monitoring, those types of things? And that's where Asta was really born. Um, and we realized this is no one is looking at this in quite the way that we are looking at it right now. Um, so that's why we, we came up with Asta. So you see it as a global, it has global impact, right? This is not something that's US centric. This is something that can apply regardless of what country we're talking about. Yeah, I think even the research that Leila did um, when she was sort of looking at um, antenatal testing in resource yeah. poor communities, you might think that sort of countries outside of the US, which it does really apply to, but it also applies to the US. We have maternal health deserts, but that is so many markets and, and countries where they don't have the infrastructure of birthing centers or maternal health clinics or ob practices, right? Um, and they don't even have the infrastructure to travel to, if, even if it's a labor and delivery unit in a hospital, very well. So ASTA works exceptionally well in other parts of the world as well as the US, um, and we'll definitely get, get to those places. Yeah, I mean, there is something in that with the, you know, all um, access to technology issues aside, there is also something that struck me about what you girls are doing, um, which is kind of, and, and we're headed that way, I think, as a society and as individuals, we're taking to a certain extent our healthcare into our own hands. So there's something about what you are doing with Aster that's, that stuck with me, which was the democratization of, of health, like putting healthcare back into the hands of the individual, because this is something that it can, it is not only can be used by clinicians or, or uh, you know, doctor's offices or um, OB GYNs, but this is something that you can actually use as a proactive tool to monitor your own health and um, maternal health. Exactly. 1000%. And I think that even outside of maternal health, like healthcare generally is headed that way. Like we have more agency, we're more, we walk around with Apple Watch devices, we understand what's going on in our body, we're trying to be healthier. We know that that's like really at the core of everything, even our our mental health is connected to our physical health, like it all matters, right? Um, and it's kind of interesting that maternal health hasn't had that just yet, given that it's it's a prolonged health event, you could argue, right? It's, it's a fixed amount of time, you are not uh, you're not under care all the time, right? So you're not in a hospital setting, you're not going in every day. Most of your pre majority, all, you might, all of your pregnancy is being done at home pretty much or when you're outside or when you're at work. So can we give people better understanding of what's going on in their body at the different phases of pregnancy? Can we actually help them um, when they're not able to physically get into an office or perhaps there's a big delay? Um, so it's not just women's health or maternal health. It's like, I can see it across all... Um, health uh, areas that it is coming into the home and agency is being given to the patient. Yeah. So then on that note, I mean, tell us exactly what it is. So what, like, what, what is ASTA? I mean, that's, that was a, a really amazing <laughs> origin story. I so enjoyed that. But for anybody listening, who's yeah. like, what is this thing and how is it going to help me? How do yeah. you describe that? So I'll share the, the concept behind Aster and how it works from the patient point of view. Mm -hmm. So the point is to be able to predict and therefore prevent those pregnancy complications, kind of what we've alluded to with things like preeclampsia, diabetes, hypertension, and to be able to do that from home. So the way we see it is if we can give patients better access to health, so via telehealth, using mm -hmm. our app, remote patient monitoring, so being able to do their blood pressure testing and their urine testing at home, which has uh, not been done before, especially in pregnancy. And if somebody did have diabetes or was at high risk of diabetes to be able to track their blood glucose at home. That combination of access and remote patient monitoring is how we envision, based on evidence that is out there, that we can actually have a effect on the pregnancy complications of which 80% are um, reversible or didn't need to occur in the first place. So that's the reason why we've decided to go down that route from the patient side. Mm -hmm. The way in which we expect to be able to deliver that to the patients is not by going directly to the patients. Mm -hmm. It might be a little bit difficult for some people to um, kind of access these, these technologies and these apps. So the way we see it is if we go to the provider, 
and we offer them services that will streamline their own clinical operations and be able for them to access their patient's data live via the app um, and allow them to improve their, their time management, things like scheduling, things like their charting and documentation. We can give them a solution for those problems that they have, whilst at the same time giving the patient the app in their hand to be able to do all of this remote monitoring and telehealth from home. Um, so Aster, in a, in a nutshell, is a provider app with digital health functionality and a uh, provider, a patient platform as well to be able to track um, and care for yourself at home. I love it. I mean, I um, use One Medical and the reason yes. why I was drawn to them was because, you know, they use AI. The whole thing is so streamlined. It's, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm having a, um, a patient interaction um, where it's not unusual to have 24 seven interactions now you can do yeah. that, right but um but just the the way that the whole system is run and you know if i want abs i mean the whole thing is run through the app everything yeah. is through the app and so it just the um the streamlining the efficiency of that for both my provider and for me as a patient is just is huge like the days but but not everybody either has access to that and and we're talking about you know a lot of gynecological offices and um and smaller uh doctor practices mm -hmm. medical practices that just don't have access to yeah. The, the same I mean one medical was bought by Amazon and so they've got the benefit of this you know beer moth behind them um and uh, of their technologies and their funding obviously but um so you know again the thing one of the things I think is amazing about what you're doing is just that it doesn't just democratize healthcare for the patient but also that what you've developed is something that is um it's just a game changer for practices right. Yeah, there's, it's one thing that's really interesting that's happening in the US is that we have this slight decline of OB-GYNs, like physicians generally are, are declining, but OB-GYNs quite rapidly as well, right? To a point where we actually are not going to have enough of them for the um, demand that we have in the US, which is kind of scary. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so that's like that. That is something that is happening. Um, but one of the things that we tapped into that we think is really interesting, and this is probably because we come from the UK, where <laughs> um, midwifery and and nursing care is is really quite prominent in women's health, more so than than OB gyn to some extent, is that you have this um, rising rate of midwives and also nurse practitioners um, and doulas and other folks who are involved in women's health, like lactation consultants as well. So if you're a nurse midwife in San Antonio, Texas, which I'm, I'm kind of referencing one of our customers right now, <laughs> yeah. um, who's traveling a couple of hours because she does like home visits and things like that to go see some patients. And we've said to her, hey, you can do your analysis and blood pressure at home. You can do telehealth. Your patient can reach you. She's like, wow, I could probably take on two, three times more patients because I'm not physically having to go to them as frequently as, as I was previously. I can serve more people who are more rural um, and I can get a bit of time back. You know, I've got family. I, I can't be, be traveling so much around. So um, it's a really interesting trend that we're observing and that we're actually tailoring Asta uh, towards. Oh, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so I, I wanted to um, also share a little bit of my story too, because um, I was um, diagnosed with preeclampsia, um, but I was um, at 31 weeks into my pregnancy and with twins, twin oh, boys. Oh my gosh. Um, and, uh, and I had no idea. I mean, I think the thing that's dangerous about this is that there is a level of unawareness for the person who is suffering from it. You have no idea. I was still at the very last minute propped up in the hospital bed, waiting to have the C-section that I had to have and working going, I, like, I really don't understand. Like I'm on my computer trying to get stuff done. Yeah. Like, I am fine. Why is everybody freaking out around me? And why did, you know, why do I have to do this? Uh -huh. um, and I will say that, you know, because I was older, an older patient with twins, you know, I was considered a higher risk, but, you know, I am curious. I mean, I feel like I, I had a, an OBGYN who was just on it. I mean, she yeah. was like monitoring me. She yeah. was like, need to see you every week and I need the pee and I need all yeah. the things, right? 
So, but my experience, I was, I feel like I was fortunate then because when I read your story, um, Layla, I was just like, wow, how does that happen? Mm -hmm. Like, how? Yeah, I think, I think you're absolutely right. And I think there's, there are many factors, which is what came up in the investigation and, and what comes up a lot in when there are problems within the healthcare system. So it's never just one thing. So if you have a, a system where you're seeing multiple different people, things can get missed. Mm -hmm. If you have a system where they are very, very busy and perhaps called away from the clinic at times and you miss an appointment, things can get missed. If somebody for forgets or there isn't systems in place that allow, you know, um, lab orders to be sort of pinged and notified to the practitioner who ordered them that will get missed you know so it's a combination and what we call it in uh, medicine as the swiss cheese model where things just keep falling mm. through and it's not that through one the holes, uh, yeah that's what we call it and it's just a known factor of healthcare um things fall through these these holes and it's not necessarily one person's job to collect everything and put it all together that they don't have the ability to do that mm. so this is where it comes down to us saying we could easily say, oh, it was this midwife's fault and it was this doctor's fault that this happened. Yeah. That's not actually the case. I'm very aware of that. And that's yeah. why with ASTA, we say, you know what? We have met and we know that there are amazing providers out there. They just want to do their work. They don't want to be sat here documenting, turning their computer on and off to fix the software that they're using and struggling so much with what's going on behind the scenes that they can't actually get their hands on the patient and give them the time to sort of look after them. Um, so yeah, so we're looking at how do we enable providers to do their very best work? Um, and so far that's that's what ASTA has been able to do. So reducing time spent booking appointments and scheduling patients, reducing time on documentation on charting, getting better documentation. And one of the big things is data collection. Mm -hmm. So us making sure that these smaller clinics who maybe don't have robust data collection systems, who maybe use paper and pen or Excel spreadsheets, uh, which we used to do as well, are able to collect more and more data so they can see where the trends are and then create solutions and recommendations based on that. And that all works into that population level sort of um, health improvement. So yeah, I, I definitely see it happening a lot. We can't ignore things like systemic bias and systemic racism in the healthcare systems, which exist in the UK and the US and across the world. Um, and again, when I say systemic, it, it's not putting blame on an individual person. Um, it's just something that we all need to be more aware of so that we can hopefully have a, a bigger impact on individual patients as they come through our doors. Mm -hmm. Because oh, so I was shocked when I read some of the stats for mm -hmm. um, you know women of color in particular, um, the infant mortality rates um, and actually the maternal mortality rates. Let's just say um, in the U.S. and actually the the Western world um, were really shocking to me. Um, you know, is it one if one in four women or two in four women? Three times, you know, black women are three times more likely to sadly pass away during pregnancy than than white women and things like that. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. It's OK. I mean, that's that's a whole other conversation and we could go down that that rabbit hole um, really, really easily um, because I find all of that really horrifying and fascinating. Like, How are we going to um, address that systemic bias and how can we do better? Providers looking like you is a big one. Um, providers understanding your experience. So, you know, the history of, um, the history in this country of midwifery and, and obstetrics and gynecology is very uh, scary. It's like, it's like American horror story, really. Uh, so there's, there's a number of things where just in healthcare, you know, uh, black patients are seen to have a higher pain threshold. There was belief some time ago that they had thicker skin, right? Like just really absurd things that you can you can see and feel have like trickled down and are like still here in some in some regards, especially not listening to patients of color where they're reporting pain and they're reporting challenges that they're having and thinking, you know, you look, you look, uh, however you look, I'm going to assume that you're strong and things like that. Therefore, you can handle this, right? 
So that does happen. There are a number of companies that are helping connect patients to providers of color, ob of color, midwives of color, things like that, which we really support and I think, think are doing amazing work. Um, other than that, like education and training is a huge one, a really, really big one. Um, providing support in, in certain areas for certain groups, um, making sure people are signed up to Medicare, uh, they have appropriate ability to pay uh, for health services as well. Um, supporting things like birth centers through grant funding, like that's a, making a big difference um the closure of clinics in certain states due to roe v wade and and some challenges around abortion is not helping at all um so there's it's a I'm cascade in of, i'm in texas so you oh, know well, yeah. yeah it's yeah but it, it's it's crazy yeah it's yeah. i mean you know we feel like we took i i don't know we just went back 30 or 40 years yeah um, yeah. It's shock. It's I can't even write my. Oh, well, most women here are shaking their heads, going, "What just happened?" Yeah, it's really quite scary. Yeah, some of our providers as well are um, really concerned about that because you know we have providers in um, other states who, alongside prenatal care, do abortions like that. They they do you know women's health, um, and then some of our providers in Texas are obviously uh, not not able to to do that um, here. So yeah. I don't know if you ladies have heard of Stephen Kotler and Peter Diamandis, but they're um, really incredible futurists. And they wrote a book called The Future is Faster Than You Think. Um, Mm -hmm. And it's basically all about how, um, well, it's not all about, but one of the things they talk about in the book, there are are various chapters on various things that are going to happen, how the future is going to be shaped. And one of the things that they talk about is they believe Um, In the next decade or so, we will have eradicated something like 14,000 common diseases um, Mm -hmm. through the use of exponential tech and what it's allowing us to create and do. So I'm really curious um, that, I mean, I know you use AI in ASTA, right? Um, But how technology is impacting, positively impacting women's health and what are some of the most exciting innovations that you see happening in the femtech space? Um, And um, what are some of the ways actually in which you personally are influencing the trajectory uh, and relevancy of the entire um, femtech and women's health industries? Yeah, we can talk. I'm we're really excited to use AI in Asta. And surprisingly, I think we thought that when we presented this to our clinicians and even patients, that there would be hesitation and resistance to say, oh, you know, no, that's not gonna do it the way I do it. For example, we have um, you know, AI transcription of appointments in Asta. So midwives and and OB guides and nurses that during delivery, they have gloves on and it's really hard to note take and chart if you have gloves on that, you know, you're using to, to give care. So they would constantly... never have thought of that. <laughs> no, it's really a thing. They're taking them off. They're having to write a note, you know, um, during labor and delivery, it's like so much information is being gathered that you have to note and chart, right? You just, you have to. And one of the things that our uh, uh, customers are really excited about was this idea that they could actually just say things out loud and it would be charted, right? So they could say heads out, for example, yeah, <laughs> and, be, and be hands-free. <laughs> Um, it's a, it seems like such a simple use case, but actually it's really powerful because it get it keeps you focused on the delivery. Actually, um, in some cases, it's you know much safer for the patient. It's really good for liability. Um, you're not having to have that many people in the room as well, right? Because sometimes there's someone who is just there to chart and note take, and that person could be somewhere else delivering care, right? So that's really interesting for us. Um, other things as well is like streamlining clinical operations with AI. So using some of that information that's coming in from the appointment and filling the chart. So automatically doing that, you've got um, Nabla Copilot, Amazon Medscribe, who, who are also helping with these things right now. And then if we think about on the patient side, that's where we're sort of, um, you have to be incredibly thoughtful. So thoughtful with that. That studies have come out where patients are more hesitant than providers about the use of AI in in healthcare, and I think we're not there yet. There's definitely they they want to see a doctor, right? They want to talk to someone face to face. But are there small things that we could do now just to um, see if it's helpful? Is that education and content? So when we know where someone is in their pregnancy, or we know they might have. Um, uh, gestational diabetes, for example, like, could we tailor that content and, and change it based on what they have in their 
their personal uh, health journey and present them with that information? And could it be conversational so they could receive some answers back? Not replacing the doctor, not replacing yeah. the, the nurse, <laughs> but being supplementary and complementary to care that they're already receiving. So those are things we're looking at. And again, just to, to what, what I started with, I've been really surprised at the reaction from care providers into how embracing they are of this software and they want it, um, which is which has been great. Well, I saw some incredible reviews, glowing mm. reviews on your website when I was looking <laughs> around it. So, I mean, it's clear that it's already having a huge impact. I think, you know, what would you say is one of the biggest challenges that you face? Because I was thinking about your business model and I was thinking about you as a startup, mm. um, a startup and I was thinking about my own entrepreneurial background. I was just, you know, how when, you, when you're starting something, I mean, I liken it to you're setting up shop in the desert. Yes. Um, and then how do you, how do people know about you? How do you spread yeah. the word? How do you get the attention? You know, when you've got something that is such an exciting breakthrough in women's health, I mean, how do you garner momentum? How do you... Yeah, I think we, we meet people, intentionally meet people and meet as many people as we can because the birth world, as it's known, mm -hmm. is very small. So the birth world in the US is actually very small. We mm -hmm. can meet someone who knows someone who knows someone and so on in every state. And so far, we've been intentionally doing that, which is why we've been to Tucson, Arizona. We went to Houston, Texas. We just landed in Phoenix today and we'll be going to San Diego next week. And it sounds and it is a lot. But there's one there is a thing about just meeting people in person, seeing them face to face and kind of building a, a relationship, whatever it may be, mm -hmm. that then means that oh, I recognize those those people. I yeah. recognize Asta. I actually think this could work. And so far, it's been the word of mouth that has allowed us to grow. So that's where we're at, at the moment. In terms of the future, Fifi, I'm sure you have many thoughts on growth <laughs> and how we're going to spread the word. <laughs> we, we've done something interesting. I think it's worth noting that we... Um, the birth world is small uh, in terms of like people, they they work in, you know, I worked at this clinic, I worked at that hospital, I know that person, everyone moves around, it's very fluid, right? You, you tend to not stay in the same place for like 20 years, you, you move around, so people know each other. But one of the kind of hacks that we have found is that we typically you'll have like a sales team or a business development team and they might be folks who've come from b2b SaaS sales and we actually are, <laughs> our sales team is technically a midwife. <laughs> herself right so we have hired a really fantastic um midwife who who works she she does labor and delivery that's her day to day but what she does is she kind of unlocks these doors for us with folks in her community um but when she actually goes to to have those conversations they're speaking the same language she's like i literally use this to you know yeah. this afternoon in my clinic setting and i'm telling you about it and it's coming from a place of care right i'm not just trying to sell you something so it's just a, a, a as you, as you mentioned, we're a startup. How do we get our name out there? You have to do things that are a little bit unusual, which is like having care providers as your sales people uh, in the beginning. So, yeah. <laughs> Whatever it takes. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Guerrilla <laughs> tactics. I'm all for them. <laughs> yeah. But that is, you know, I was thinking about what you just said. And for me, because this is how my brain works. What I just heard you say was that the birth industry I mean, kind of anywhere in the world is really, a, it's a small entity in a way. I mean, everyone knows everyone from what you're just describing to me. And then I think about the gigantic responsibility that women carry. I mean, we give birth. We are responsible for bringing uh, humans into the world and yet it seems to me the way that we prioritize that extraordinary, I mean, it doesn't, it's it's the stuff of miracles, um, that it should be surrounded by such a small industry and support system. Yes, yes, it is. And I think that um it's it's kind of it speaks to the fact that women's health has been overlooked for quite some time, yeah. right? Um really long time uh just to give you one example the thousands of years can we say thousands of years, <laughs> thousands of years. <laughs> even just the like the schedule of prenatal care um hasn't changed in 100 years so yeah. this 100 years ago they said okay I'm going to see you at week 12 I'm going to see you here and I'm going to 
that is the same as what we are doing today. Not that it, it I mean, it works to some extent, right? We could argue it has worked. Um, but in the US, obviously, maternal health is getting worse. We're, we're, we're um, more likely, sadly, to pass away today in pregnancy than our parents' generation, which is a crazy stat to think about. Um, so even just that alone, that hasn't changed. Uh, and yes, the birthing world is small. And even the providers have a huge responsibility yeah. over all these women and families and, and birthing individuals uh, across the US um, and they're doing their best. I think that's the thing that that, that resonates with me is that they're really trying um, and they're, they don't have as much support as they need, yeah. right? Even as much as um, midwives and nurse practitioners don't receive the same amount of like reimbursement for a similar level of care to a physician, things like that make it really hard to to get into this world and, and be self-sustainable, right? As a, as a company, as a clinic. Right. Yeah. And for it to be attractive as an industry to, yes. you know, um, mm -hmm. women, anyone who wants to enter that space of women's health and maternal care. And you mentioned earlier, just some like futuristic technology. And I was thinking about it. <laughs> um, there's, there's a couple of things just on the at home health section that we were looking at, um, you know, um, portable devices like that's where I come from when I was at Meta we were building hardware so I'm really excited about that we've got um at home Dopplers and things like that where you know do that under supervision and that's great you can see what's going on um portable ultrasound devices which doesn't just have a use for maternal health could be used to everywhere in your body essentially which is really amazing and I think that can really transform healthcare and then you've got things just more on the um the prevention side so uh pills that have come out that help um help manage and treat preeclampsia really early on we've just I believe that just became uh, available in the UK more readily um so things like that are really interesting and then I think on the surgery side I don't know if you ever did any uh, robotics <laughs> robotics robotics is so interesting yeah. I know I don't think I ever got to actually do bring it, it. Bring yeah. it. You're talking, I mean, this is what <laughs> my colleague, our co-founder, Nancy, and I do. I mean, we work in um, foresight in the future, you know, exponential futures. So, you know, you can talk to me about robotics and AR and VR and all that stuff. Like, I, I know for a fact my colleagues back home are training using their VR headsets yeah. and they're training on robotic surgery right I mean laparoscopic surgery was where I left it at if that makes sense and that was innovative of itself and has been around for decades but robotics now that's a whole different thing and I think it's so exciting I think even from the physician world that that I know AI is being welcomed yes but things like helping us to read chest x-rays I mean yeah. if you've ever worked on an ER floor mm -hmm. and you have to see a chest x-ray for every single patient in the middle of the night I don't think anybody could deny that it takes some time mm -hmm. <laughs> you know you've got to concentrate you really need to try to find the very smallest of details and these things do get missed and they're not necessarily always a serious thing if that gets missed but if there is in any way something can just guide your eye just to give you that little helping hand and we see it in Asta as being that digital assistant mm -hmm. not someone to replace you or to take over but just to just point things out streamline things make things quicker um then yeah it all of these things that I believe and I've seen I've been very much welcomed by the medical community mm -hmm. um obviously there's hesitation and, and obviously products like AI will change and grow over time but it's interesting and that's that's as much as we need right now yes <laughs> yeah I definitely think as um people are exposed to the efficiencies of it yeah. It's, I mean, it becomes literally life-changing slash game-changing. So um, I think that that's all it takes sometimes is for people to see how it can um, really positively augment our existence and make our lives easier, um, you know, versus the the dystopic, dystopic narrative that we often hear around technology. Um, you know, I think that we're seeing more and more how um, it's able to, uh, streamline our existence and that's a that's a good thing you know that opens up a world of possibilities for other things another thing we haven't mentioned it in much detail is the prediction element and yeah. using AI to sift through the data that we as a company have sort of collected by these clinics and that they collect for themselves and be able to pull out trends in those communities not in the population level communities where I was not necessarily classified as high risk, but maybe I should have been. Those things that haven't yet been discovered, mm -hmm. we believe that, you know, 
after 12 months of using Asta, there'll be such a large data set that we would have that we'd be able to look through that data and use AI to better predict where things might happen. And that might not just be in medical risk, mm -hmm. that might be in social determinants of health mm -hmm. and piecing together a combination of things that are otherwise done on paper. And, you know, use, a provider has to sit and really think, is this person somebody that I need to go and see more often? Do I need to bring them in more often? Should I focus on their mental health? Because although they don't have a medical diagnosis today, mm -hmm. they display the characteristics that would give them that postnatal depression in the in the postnatal period. So yes. we are hugely focused on data collection and interpretation but in order to use AI um, to predict risk and the development of complications during pregnancy and, and beyond actually. Mm -hmm. um, another one I'm sad to say about preeclampsia and you may have felt this is that we suddenly developed an extremely high risk of chronic hypertension stroke yes. and heart disease yes. because we had preeclampsia but the thing is we don't know what to do about it because the research stops there. Mm -hmm. They tell us here you go. Good luck. And, you know, maybe we'll see you in 20 or 30 years when you have this problem. So how do we look at what happens next? You know, what happens? Oh, I, I'm just having like a come to Jesus moment because <laughs> recently I um, I went to my doctor. Actually, I went to the dentist and he took my blood pressure. I mean, just standard things, took my blood pressure. And it was 181 over 109, something like that. And he's like, um, I can't do that. Like I can't administer an anesthetic. This is really high. You need to go to, you know, an emergency clinic. My advice would be now. Um, mm -hmm. And so I'm going, what? <laughs> Basically, <laughs> what the fuck? Put the fear of God on me. And my blood pressure at the end of that had risen to 220 over 114. Like I should have been having a stroke. I probably yeah. should have been die uh, dying I should have been flatlining at that point somehow but I wasn't and I felt absolutely fine like it's so freaky and now we did some monitoring um uh, to come up with some sort of data baseline for yeah. what is actually happening with me and it turns out I do have a predisposition to hypertension and but I like none of this would have surfaced Okay. you know it were not for that dental visit yeah. <laughs> so crazy um, it's terrifying yeah. you know I, I think it's absolutely terrifying like we we don't know what things like preeclampsia are before it happens to yeah. us right. we don't know what it is when it's happening and right. then we don't know what it is after the fact right why people unfortunately get very sick mm. we see a lot of unfortunate maternal mortality rates being in the postpartum period because of preeclampsia mm -hmm. and, and no one said to me okay so what you need to do when you exit the hospital is you have to and I had to go back keep going back to NICU because my yeah. boys were in NICU for five weeks which was brutal in and of itself you know that you went through it but for any woman who's gone through it uh, it's no fun. Um, yeah. But, you know, no one said to me, listen, you're going to need to just keep an eye on your blood pressure. Like this, this is, has been a problem and, you know, here's why. And it's going to be something that you really need to monitor over basically over the course of your life going forward. Yeah. There's a reason why this has come up now, you know, it doesn't just happen to everyone. Yeah, we see that, you know, most most maternal uh, complications and deaths are unfortunately after um, delivery. Yeah. And um, one of the things we're, we're really excited about is this this idea that like that blood pressure cuff that that gets sent out to you or that your clinic provides, like you keep that like don't you don't need to return that. Like that's really important that you have that following the delivery and then for the next 12 months at least. And if you had preeclampsia, oh my God, like yeah, you should be checking um at some interval after you've delivered. Yeah. Yeah. But there is so much fatigue after you've had given birth and you have no idea. Like I don't know any parent who would say, oh I knew exactly what I was doing. I was yeah. fine. Like I put my checklist and yeah. I was good. Like yeah. it doesn't happen like that. And so I do think there's, you know, to a certain extent, some overwhelm and that's certainly a lot of fatigue that yeah. is going on. And so, you know, I just feel like that is one of those things that kind of just falls off the radar because your focus is not really you, it's your baby or babies. Yeah. 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 And there's also this this issue that we're seeing, especially in the US, where the prenatal, the postnatal visit is at six weeks. 
sometimes you're lucky if you get a call in a week or two after mm. delivery but it tends to just be at six weeks and then that's it but the postnatal period continues for 12 months the data sets that you will surface as a result of um, Aster are uh, going to be, I think, astronomically helpful. But I do, you know, I think the fact that we are talking about the, the whole postpartum experience too, as part of this, um, you know, information gathering, like what, you know, because it, it does seem to me like there's a lot of pre-care, like there's, there are people are paying attention while you're pregnant, but once you're not, it's the level of care becomes almost non-existent. So I do, you know, I'm, I'm, I wonder if you're going to come up with something next that is <laughs> that whole part of things, or that will just be an extension of Asta somehow. Yeah, I think so. I mean, we're, you know, Asta doesn't stop at maternal health. Like a lot of our providers do sexual health, gyne- all forms of like gynecolo- gynecology care. Um, and then on the other side of that, like I mentioned, you've got um, doulas, lactation consultants, even people who are looking at just postpartum mental health, right? How can they be a part of like the ASTA network and deliver care and how can patients access them? Many people, a lot of people um, only interface with an ob when they become pregnant. Like that's the first time that they meet an ob yeah. And that's the first time that they meet a midwife or like everyone, of course, it makes sense. Um, but providing them access to those people um, and then those people providing postpartum care is really interesting. One of the things I saw, I just, when I woke up this morning, there's a a new um, postpartum clinic that's opened in San Francisco. You know, it's where you get really high high quality care and you're well looked after. And obviously we have to think about access and price and how can we make the even the bare minimum available to women and families across the US who couldn't afford something like that, right? And what does that look like? But I think it starts with one, just your, your care provider, do, seeing you slightly more frequently afterwards, like that's probably the first step and not just having one visit um, that's at the six week point. And you can do that via telehealth. You yeah. can make it easier and simpler via telehealth. We think of maternal health as a woman's issue or a woman, not issue, woman a, a woman's domain. Um, but what about that LGBTQ community and maternal health in that space? Like how is what you're doing changing the conversation or is it? Yes, it is. So, so well, we hope it is. That's our yeah. that's our hope and our plan. One of the, the use cases that we've been really interested in um, that we our co founder his his name is Andrew, and this is sort of something that he's really keen on as well is um, surrogacy. So that's something that we're quite uh, interested in looking at. Um, and one of the ways that Asta makes it really easy is if you do have or you go down the path of surrogacy, it can feel a little bit like a black box, like you don't know what's happening uh, with the uh, person who's the surrogate and their care. But we've been interested in making um, Asta available to individuals who are um, involved in that person's care in a way that makes sense. And this also applies to other folks in the family, right? Um, but really applies well in like the LGBTQ plus community as well. Um, so that's something we've been looking at. Yeah as well as that tying us uh, more upstream to things like fertility as well and looking at how we can partner with those folks so um sometimes people <laughs> yeah exactly um so how can we not all fertility clinics it kind of stops at i think the 12 week yeah. mark is when you sort of get you transition over to um prenatal care so having that uh, continuation of care being able to get all of their records across and understand where they've come from and make that really seamless and easy and having that um transition be quite smooth if Asta is a partner there makes a lot of sense to us so those are a couple of things yeah. we're thinking about I would just say um, on the design from you know from oh, Fifi's yeah. point of view just as simple as the design and language oh, right yeah we are very conscious that a lot of tools that exist right now especially in out of hospital care are pink and purple and they have flowers everywhere and it mm. is an absolute nightmare even for us to say, well, why is everything to do with women's health treated as a cuddly yeah. feminine object? We we just want healthcare, right? And so we we are trying to create an inclusive space that fits everybody. What we spoke about earlier with um people of color resonating with people of color. Well, people with um difference or identities want to see those types of people in their care. We notice that a lot in birth centers and the community birth world as well. So we just want to create a space where we can support those people, where sometimes in hospital, it's quite difficult to do that. So our language, our design, us being very neutral, we have a 
a green logo. We don't put any flowers in there. We don't put pictures of babies and things like that because a lot of what we do is actually reproductive healthcare and it's not necessarily um, maternal healthcare, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. So yeah, so we're conscious and we're yeah. forward thinking and we hope that we're doing justice to the LGBT community with what we're building. Yeah, it's. Yeah. I'll just say one thing, Emma, and I won't, we, we don't need to like talk about any like competitors or things like that, but the the, the origin of the, software around maternal health is um not necessarily up to to speed with where things are and it's quite restrictive in its use and language and it says things like husband and wife in in some of that technology um and it you know and and people are requesting those things to be changed right um and when they look at asta and they're like it's not even a question <laughs> so it's it's sad, it's sad that 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 has been the the status quo for quite some time um uh, and I think it's it's really interesting that we didn't even realize that that was what was happening until we got told from some of our providers that like I cannot it it's literally telling me to put a husband's name in here and I'm like what am I doing I can't do what can I do with this um, so they're sending requests in and saying hey can you change this and they're like you know that's what we recognize we don't recognize other things so we're not going to make that change so you know really harmful wow. Stuff. yeah wow did you want to say something Layla? No, I'm just agreeing. Just thinking yeah. about it, we see it from the perspective of patients as well yeah. when we speak to people. And it and but like you said, when when you say harmful, that is actually completely accurate because it puts people in, in a position where they cannot access care. And if you cannot access care and you're in a situation where you're pregnant, for example, we're talking about life threatening situations. We're not mm-hmm. talking about just like, oh, well, I might not go to the hospital. No, these things can have serious consequences. And it comes down to very small things like language and inclusivity and so microaggressions yeah. as well well yeah. I mean I do feel like that is often the difference between um you know nimble disruptive startups and these big institutionalized um healthcare systems is that you know I mean a you're young so by default you have I think a, just a different worldview culturally on how to message around this stuff but also you're able to act quickly so you know I mean whereas um, other providers aren't necessarily you know there are a lot more hoops to jump through there's a lot more yeah yeah for sure yeah yeah um so just to wrap it up then um I would like to know like what is your vision for the evolution of women's health in general you know what would you love to see emerge what would you love to see happen in an ideal world like what's the moonshot hmm it's funny because like the the moonshot for us almost feels like well duh like a simple thing you know like because it's so bad it's like the moonshot is that even just from from my perspective so much of um medical research and clinical trials I think the number is like 70 percent of all of that research has been done on on men um and you know that that kind of stat is the crash test dummy can we talk about that they used to, it was not until recently, I couldn't believe this. Like I just about spat my coffee when I read this, that they've been testing with crash test dummies that are male physiques yeah. for, for forever, ever yeah. since we've been using, you know, doing seatbelt testing. And it was not until recently that someone pointed out that actually a woman's physique is completely different. The um, the impact, um, the impacts of, of are completely different in a woman's body and therefore we should be you know factoring in the female physique when we are figuring out um safety in vehicles um and seatbelts and I was just like oh my I'd never stop to think that that might not even be happening but there is so much to your point of our current um healthcare research and funding and systems that have all been developed and, and this is not this is in no way, shape, or form um, a a um, a diss to men or the fact that it has been male focused, but it has to change because um, you know we're, the physiology of of a female is completely different to that of a male, and even when it comes to talking about heart health, 
you know, it is a different animal to uh, like, you know, and all the research comes from, um, from basically male, the male physique. And so I'd see, and you can probably attest to this, that the space, women's health space is exploding. Like it is in a moment where so much is changing, so much is coming to light. Is that what you guys are experiencing too? I mean, you're you're in it. Like you're yes. part of what is changing the status quo. Yeah, and I think every time we talk to even, you know, friends and family members, and we're talking about things like, Um, services that are coming out for PCOS and endometriosis and menopause and fertility and you know maternal health even um, contraceptive health and things like that it's like it's it's amazing to see everyone like I say finally it's it's typically women-led companies uh, who and often uh, women investors as well who are backing these companies (laughs) Um, and it shouldn't just be us but again I think I think it's great it's amazing to to see that we're really sort of taking um, charge here and and um, doing things like if no one else is going to do it I'm going to do it like that's the kind of like feeling that I think a lot of us have and a number of women's health companies start from their own story that's what I found across the board right um which makes total sense you just you have that fight in you you're like I can't rest until this is sorted um so yeah we're definitely seeing it it's amazing yeah I my my general moonshot I know it's not that futuristic but it's just that people could have a pregnancy and a baby and not be scared that they would have something very serious happen and just essentially allowing patients to have a pregnancy and a delivery that is that suits them that they understand and that they're comfortable with mm-hmm. i would love to see the maternal mortality rate in the in the western world and in across the world reduce even if it's by two percent mm-hmm. that would be my my life's goal complete <laughs> that's it <laughs> you're done you die happy. <laughs> i've been done <laughs> no you won't be because then you're going to be dealing with the whole postpartum thing oh, no, <laughs> <we've spoken laughs> exactly. yes <laughs> yeah we can always more work to be done. exactly <laughs> I mean you can't stop at that look at the the brilliance that is you right now I mean I cannot ever see you losing your um, passion and impetus for helping women and I'm just thank you so so much for this conversation today and sharing more about what it is that you are doing in the world I mean really what with the Femme Future Society but our mission is to really amplify um and champion the voices of women who are making a difference in the world and oh my god you you two are just nailing it thank you so much thank you so much emma i really love this conversation i love meeting you and honestly um, yes. yes 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 thank you so much